Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum. And then when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts please you, Lord. You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I get to do one of my favorite things this morning, which is to confess a mistake that I have made. So, if you would do me the favor of pulling out the Book of Common Prayer in the pew in front of you and turning to page 233. For those of you in the choir loft without a prayer book, you're just going to have to trust me on this one. Every week here at Good Shepherd, our preachers are given a copy of the bulletin well in advance and asked to read it and make sure everything is right, and I failed to do that for this service this week. And the collect we heard at the beginning of the service is the one on page 233 from September uh, proper 18. You can look in your bulletin and see that. So um, I'm going to actually talk about the collect for today, so if you'll turn the page... Proper 20 is today, so when I start talking about it, you'll know where I am. Thank you for your grace and forgiveness. So our actual collect for today starts us on a journey through some wonderful and practical scripture readings. That's what the collect does each week. It collects the thoughts of the readings and all of our concerns into one prayer that we offer up to God. So today, The collect is this, grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Well, my friends, there are a lot of concerns in our world just now that we might be anxious about. And it is good for us to be regularly reminded that we, the church, are to put our trust in things that endure. That word endure is one of my favorite words. It's at least my favorite word that starts with the letter E. I don't like to think of enduring so much as surviving a trial, which if you look it up, that's probably what you're going to see, but I like to think of enduring in terms of things that are lasting, in terms of sticking things out. And there are many aspects of the Christian life and faith that are about endurance. I don't know, the election season, Texas summer, and according to some of the guys in our dad's Bible study, getting through the book of Ecclesiastes. Those are all things that we're called to endure. Did he laugh? Okay, good. When I was uh, a college student at Texas A&M University, um, many, many, many years ago, I was part of several Christian groups on campus. 
Now, Christian culture in a college town is a fascinating thing, and I learned a lot of things in my late teens and early 20s about the Bible, about myself, and about Christianity. But I was also fairly wounded during that time through making some unfair comparisons. We used to joke in my apartment and the house I lived in and with other groups that all of us young guys were looking for P31 wives. P31. That's a reference to the proverb that we heard this morning, Proverbs 31. A capable wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. Well, that sounds good. But then as we go through the list of her qualifications, that P31 wife, I think we run into some trouble. She rises while it's still night and provides food for her household. She considers a field and buys it. She makes linen garments and sells them. She opens her mouth and wisdom and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. It seems as we read through Proverbs 31 that this idealist wife is perfect. She has all the qualities that anyone would want in a spouse and none of the imperfections. So I want you to imagine, if you can, being a young 20-something guy, wandering around College Station, trying to find this perfect woman, comparing each and every person, prospective dating partner that I met with this list of qualifications, who could possibly live up to the comparison. Let's just say I didn't date a lot in college. And while Proverbs 31 outlines this list of qualities that describe an idealized wife, my real-life wife, Allison, of 18-plus years, has yet to shear a sheep to make us clothing. In spite of me asking her multiple times at multiple houses to plant a vineyard in our backyard, she has not done that. And yet, she is a most capable wife, far more precious than Jules. My heart does trust in her. If I were stuck in comparing her to this list from Proverbs, that wouldn't be a very helpful or productive way to appreciate the gift that she is. You see, the danger of taking Proverbs 31 or any other checklist for a person is that it encourages us to judge another, and it leads to unhelpful and unfair comparisons. And those get us into trouble pretty quick. I was recently reminded of an important saying, perhaps you've heard it too, comparison is the thief of all joy. But you say, we live in a culture that is obsessed with status. Many of us get starstruck. Some of us mistakenly are understand our own value only when we compare it to another person. And this is one of the biggest challenges with social media for all of us. Sometimes we even get to arguing about who is better. In our gospel reading today, the disciples are doing exactly the same thing. After Jesus has sent them out two by two to continue the work of preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons, they've come back and now they're arguing about who is the greatest disciple. Imagine this ridiculous conversation. Hey, Simon, did you see the way I cast out that demon? I'm the best disciple. No, no, Andrew. I was able to heal that paralyzed woman. I am better at following Jesus than you are. Wait, wait, wait. You guys missed it when I preached repentance and all of those families turned from their evil ways and they even came to hear Jesus. I am the best. Ridiculous, right? And yet, we do it too. Mark regularly portrays the disciples as slow to understand, and I'm very grateful because I too am slow to understand. Here, they're arguing about who is the greatest even after Jesus has explained to them that to follow him means to take up the cross. By comparing their own actions and acts of power, the disciples were missing the point. Such comparisons lead to jealousy, power struggles, and frustration, not the foundation of faith that Jesus 
was working to build. And so, he takes a little child, and he puts it in front of them as a corrective, and he says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And not only me, but the one who sent me. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus will take it even further. He says, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So maybe the reality is that our comparisons are backwards. We've got them mixed up. Instead of trying to be the wealthiest or the most educated or the one with the most power, what would it look like if all of us took the lead from children and we sought humility and joy as our life goals? After all, Jesus teaches whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And servanthood is indeed one of our major tasks in this life of faith. If we are to love God with all of our hearts and soul, mind and strength, and love our neighbor as we love ourselves, then surely we are to serve God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and to serve our neighbor as well. It's a very challenging task to serve other people when we are constantly comparing ourselves to see if we are better or better off than they are. Keeping up with the Joneses, as the expression goes, certainly gets in the way of serving and loving our neighbors. We're all on this journey of faith together, and while we each travel our own path, dealing with our own struggles and enduring our own particular suffering, we are by no means alone on this journey. Prioritizing our Christian faith with humility means recognizing and remembering that there are other people on this journey with you. Some have come before us, and they have established this foundation on which we walk. Some travel the way with us, comforting us, guiding us, and others will follow after us. So having this understanding helps us to practice gratitude, humility, and service, and it helps us to avoid the dangers of comparison. Instead of measuring our lives in order to determine if we're better off than the ones who've come before us, or wondering if those who come after us will live into their faith as we have lived into ours, let us instead focus on loving and serving our neighbor, helping each and every person that we encounter to live better and more full lives of service to the Lord. Let us put all those comparisons aside and look to the children to lead us, welcoming their humility and their joy into our hearts, even as we welcome our Lord. Amen.